and welcome to the Pod Well Travelled. I'm your host, Penny Thomas, and today in the studio, I'm joined by my colleague and fellow travel writer, Mollens Johansson. Welcome back to the pod. Thank you very much, Penny. Good to be here. Yes. So in today's episode, we'll be discussing Cambodia, which is a beautiful place in, in Southeast Asia. It's somewhere... I've never been, but you've recently travelled there for a couple of assignments. Yeah, I've been a couple of times in recent, last couple of months, shall I say. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, prior to that, it was, uh, you know, my first visit was about 15 years ago. So I've sort of seen how it's evolved over over that time period. And, uh, you know, so it's been really interesting. Mm -hmm. I really like it as a destination. Yeah. Um, I guess, can you tell us some fast facts about Cambodia? Yeah, you know, it's a country of around 17 million people. Um, It's a constitutional monarchy, which is, I guess, a bit unusual for for that sort of area. Um, And uh, they have a a sort of elected uh, parliamentary system much like ours here. Mm and uh, I guess what other fun facts, I mean, Angkor Wat, the temple complex up in the north of the country up near Siem Reap is one of the, the sort of seven wonders of the world. Uh, and that's an amazing place. I mean, where in anyone going to Cambodia should definitely not miss out on that. Um, and the other quirky thing is the Cambodian flag is the only one in the world with a building on it. And you'll never guess what the building is. No, I can't think of it. I would almost say temple, but no. Yeah, well, it is. It's Angkor Wat. <laughs> yeah, right. And and uh, in fact, when you are when you're in Cambodia, Angkor Wat, the buildings feature on just about anything. So um, yeah, so that's kind of interesting. Um, the other thing, uh, it has a very large freshwater lake up in the north of the country, up near Siem Reap, in fact, uh, it's called Tonle Sap, uh, and it's the largest in Southeast Asia. Um, and then I guess a couple of not so much, not so fun facts is the uh, the horror of that Khmer Rouge regime and Pol Pot uh, during the 70s, which basically, you know, Pol Pot wanted to reset the country to year zero, and he wiped out academics and artists and uh, uh, musicians in in a in a mass genocide, basically. So it's a it's a pretty uh, horrible piece of history but uh, despite all that uh, having happened in fairly recent times mm. Cambodians are really sort of happy and friendly people there uh, they don't seem to be holding a grudge and they seem pretty content with their lot you know both the people I've met in the cities and and also out in small villages you know uh, they, they may not have a lot but they seem quite content and happy mm. Yeah. No, it's got a very interesting history or, and recent history as well. Mm, yeah. Um, okay. What about – how did you go about getting to Cambodia? Did you fly from Australia? Uh, yes. Uh, so I travelled uh, to Cambodia via Singapore. Uh, so both Singapore Airlines and Scoot have, you know, flights that connect to both Siem Reap and Phnom Penh. Um, so, uh, so that's pretty easy. Um how long is the the, the flight, flight from here to Singapore? Is about five hours, and then it's about two to Siem Reap and Phnom Penh, whichever yep. you choose. So it's not it's not too bad. Mm. Uh, and uh, Singapore Airlines have usually got pretty good connections, so there's not too too much of a wait in uh, in Singapore. Mm. Uh, you do need to arrange. Uh, a visa, uh, but it's a pretty easy process. It's an e visa, uh, in particular when you r- arrive through uh, arrive by air, you can use that. I did have a uh, the most recent trip. I arrived from Vietnam via boat, mm-hmm. and um, then you can't, uh, you know, the port that we were coming through, you can't use e visas. So you you do. St- need to be aware of which way you sort of arrive in the country uh, and and what sort of visa you you need but in most cases the e-visa would be the way to go yeah okay um that's very interesting and i guess how well sort of connected is cambodia to the to the rest of the world if we're thinking about international listeners uh very good and probably even better now up in Siem Reap in particular which is the you know where the the temples are as I mentioned and and their big tourist attraction they've just built a, a 
flash new airport up there and it, in fact it opened just as I was uh, the day before I left the country mm-hmm. so I saw it you know shiny and new and and the idea with that is that they're wanting to encourage uh you know, uh, airlines from around the world to have direct flights into Siem Reap so, you know, people can can come and see the temples without having to come through Phnom Penh or, you know, other um, regional airports sort of thing. So they, they want to foster that direct flight to Siem Reap, see the temples and then, you know, back out again. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What an interesting approach. Mm. Um, and what about getting around Cambodia? What would you recommend people do? Look, uh, I mean, the first time when I was there 15 years ago, I went around on motorbikes and that sort of stuff. And that's Just, a fun way to get around. Yeah, but, I hear it's you know, quite popular. A lot of people do motorcycles. Yeah, yeah they do. But I mean, it doesn't come without risk, yes. obviously. Uh, in particular, as the traffic, uh, it, it can be challenging yeah you want to know <laughs> and, what you're and, doing and guess. busy so yeah. uh, it's perhaps best if you are out in sort of more rural areas where you know there's less traffic i i wouldn't recommend it in you know a big city like phnom penh for example because it's it's pretty full on the traffic and uh, fairly random things happen mm-hmm. along the way but in my experience uh, you know when you're in i mean whether it's phnom penh or siem reap tuk-tuks are a really good way to get around you know for a few dollars you can jump in the back on one and and they'll take you wherever you want to go mm-hmm. so i found that's a good safe and fun way to get around you know uh you're you're in the fresh air and uh yeah just experience it's more of a sort of an authentic experience i guess than mm. than jumping in a taxi and um uh, and so on but having said that you know if you're arriving in cambodia for the first time uh, you know, it's probably a nice thing to arrange a, a hotel transfer from the airport to the hotel. Just takes the stress out of the whole process. You know, you can get your suitcases in there. Everything is taken care of, and then yeah, uh, you're good to go. You can you can explore tuk tuks or motorcycles or other forms of transport from there on. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. And um, I guess there's also different sort of coaches as well that probably operate in that area. And you recently did a boat cruise. Um, yes, I did. So that was my most recent trip. That was up uh, a river cruise from uh, Vietnam up to well, basically up to Siem Reap along the Mekong River, which was really interesting because you, you get a totally different perspective there. And, and you know, you, you really had a, a sense of discovery as you as you pull into a lot of these little villages alongside the uh, the river and uh, walk into their life for for a short period of time. So that was a, a nice way to get around. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, awesome. Okay, and um, what about some likes and dislikes about Cambodia, if you've got any? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, generally speaking, um, generally speaking, I like pretty much everything about Cambodia I mean the people are lovely I love the food um, and and just the the sort of yeah the gentle nature of the people you know they're really uh, welcoming and uh, and interested in in you as a person not just as a as a you know cash machine Mm. so to speak so um, you know I think I think that's uh, that's perhaps the, the thing I like the most the Things I didn't like so much is perhaps the humidity, you know. I mean, it is quite, it's either, you know, really hot during the, the dry season or really humid during the wet season. Mm. And uh, so th- so that is a bit of a challenge when, if you, in particular, if you like walking around and that sort of stuff, it, it does get a bit sticky and uncomfortable yeah. from time to time. But, but I mean, they're minor things that you expect in that part of the world. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily just put that down to a thing I dislike about Cambodia. It's yeah. probably more the region generally. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Um, I guess just on that, can you tell us, so when is the dry season and when is the wet season? Uh, good see, uh, good question. Uh, we can come back to it. Yeah, we, can, we can come back. Uh, uh, I mean, when I was there just last month was the end of the – wet season yeah uh so so basically from now on then we're coming into the dry season yep. uh so that's a little bit of a help but actually for how long it goes i couldn't tell you no that's exactly okay. we can just off the it. top of my head <laughs> okay um so what about accommodation in cambodia i think you've recently stayed 
um, at a property where you were sort of glamping. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that was a really, uh, really fun experience. But but generally speaking, when you're in Phnom Penh or Sihanoukville or or Siem Reap, you know, you'll find all the big modern hotels there. Yeah. Uh, so you know, you you'll have no issues finding good quality accommodation. And of course, there's a range of backpackers and various other options as well. But uh, the one you refer to. Uh, it was a really special experience. It's a place called Shintamani Wild, mm-hmm. and it's, uh, as the name suggests, out in the wilds in a place called the Cardamom uh, National Park. And it's sort of this, it's really sort of glamping. There's these massive, uh, well, ma- when I say massive, but they're really big tents situated in in sort of secluded spots along a river that sort of cascades down through uh you know boulders and forests and that sort of stuff and uh you you really feel like you're glamping sort of royalty style you know it's it's an amazing experience and and uh they're they're the way they're designed the 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 Tents. Mm. It's really wrong calling them tents because um, they 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 feel much more like like a a, a giant room. Yeah, and they're very high end as well. I think yeah, I've seen pictures. Yeah, and uh, they they're sort of you you kind of walk uh, onto them uh, and you feel like you're in the in amongst the treetops. Mm. So they're, they're built up on poles, so you kind of walk in from the bank of the river, and then onto these. Uh, you know these platforms where the tents are and uh, uh, yeah it's you really feel like you're in amongst the trees and then the river cascades down below and you know there's gibbons in the trees and you know it's a really tropical sort of oasis yeah really it's amazing I think the um it it probably sounds weird saying tents and and glamping like that but the reason that you probably have to refer to them is that it's because they're sort of that semi-permanent structure to make sure that they don't damage the land and they're not building big sort of concrete things in, in the middle of a, yeah. a park and um, but they're really well done and have all the amenities that you sort of yeah, need and, and more so I guess yeah absolutely like I mean the whole idea of this place here it's a, a sort of collaboration between a Cambodian businessman called Sokun and uh, an American landscape and interior designer called Bill Bensley who's mm. designed several hotels around the world uh, so it's got his unmistakable stamp to it. It, it has that sort of safari feel. Yes. But uh, the, the reason they got involved with this Shintamani Wild was really to preserve that, that tract of land that it sits on. Yeah. So, um, so, so they're heavily involved with conservation and obviously that's the reason why they've chosen the tents rather than permanent structures. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's like... I could go on about this place for a long time, but it's like just to give you an idea how how it differs from other places is uh, well for a start, most guests have the option of zip lining into the hotel when you arrive, which is uh, you know a bit out there, but yeah. but uh, it's a really fun way to to sort of arrive. There's this I forget exactly how long it is now, but it's uh, several hundred meters long. You fly down through the valley over the trees and you basically arrive in the bar and there's someone standing there with a welcome drink wow wow you sort of have to let go before you get in yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) so it's a pretty amazing way to uh, to arrive but but what sets uh sintamani uh wild and and its sister hotel in uh, siem reap apart from other places is that they have you have a like a personal butler when you're there so they arrange everything for you you know you're used to sort of people people welcoming you know when you come to a, a hotel and that sort of stuff but they really go the extra mile and um, everything is included you know from your excursions and so on much like what you were talking about last week at um Club Med, yeah. Uh, Club Med, uh, but but you have like these personal, or well, in in the case of Shintamani Wild, they call them adventure butlers. Mm. So they basically look after everything for you, everything you want to do. You just ask them and they'll arrange it. Yeah, so, like a little confidant that's sort of yeah, like an assistant yeah, to help you with exactly. whatever you need. And yeah. yeah, it does sound weird sometimes saying butler because it just seems a bit yeah, outdated. It seems, but seems it, a, it's sort yeah. of just this companion that you've got for the trip. Who's yeah, just and, and they really, they really. 
sort of do become your friends because they're you know as well as uh you know them arranging all these kind of things you 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 kind of uh, you rely on them for information and all that sort of stuff and I certainly found that uh, Daniel the guy I had looking yeah. after me in in uh, Sintamani Wild he was he was more like a, a mate just yeah. about you know and and he would just sort things out for me <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I believe that the Shintamani sort of collection because I think there's a couple of properties yeah, in Cambodia there's a, there's a few around yeah, yeah and yeah. they have a, a foundation as well which really helps um, yeah, they the locals give, there and they give a certain amount of money back to uh, the, their foundation the Shintamani Wild life foundation so it's a bit of a long story but but there's basically uh, you know for example the wild uh, they have uh, you know you can go out on anti-poaching patrols for example and and these anti-poaching patrols are, are funded by Sintamani wild so that you know to to preserve you know the area uh, and the wildlife that that live there because traditionally you know the the people who lived around there may have been you know poaching various animals both for food and to resell as sort of exo- exotic animals mm. so by going out on some of these excursions uh, is really an interesting experience in its mm. in its own right uh, but uh, it it helps fund these sort of projects so yeah yeah. no that's it i think it's important in this day and age that um hospitality groups like that sort of do their part especially in a place like cambodia yeah take some responsibility for for the area but i think you know in from the experience i had you know they're definitely very much aware of that and they they purchased this piece of land with exactly that in mind Mm -hmm. it's not like they just they just came up with the idea that they wanted a a resort there it was more the resort is put there to blend in with the environment and then it 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 also gives back to the community both mm. in the form of work for for the local people but also funding projects like like the uh, the wildlife rangers mm. yeah no i did i think i i spoke to the owner so is it Sokin? Sokin, yeah. Yeah, yeah um maybe last year and we discussed the um hospitality group where they sort of train um, local Cambodian people yeah. up and they really try to foster that experience for them and Sokin said that he was at a different um, hotel somewhere else around the world and a Cambodian person that came up through his, that sort of academy was then serving him at a different hotel yeah. and it, it really does then go back into their community that person supports their family and yeah it's a it's a really interesting place that that seems to really put its people at the forefront as well and take care of them which is good yeah absolutely um all right, so let's talk about what what were your sort of must see, must do, and must eat experiences in <laughs> Cambodia. Well, I think you know Angkor Wat and the the other temples up near Siem Reap, there like the Bayon and Ta Prom, uh, are definitely not to be missed. I mean, they are. It's not for you know they're not called one of the seven wonders of the world for nothing. I mean, it really is an amazing place. Um, and then uh, down in in uh, Phnom Penh, I guess despite the horror of it, a visit to the Killing Field and the Holocaust Museum at the Trul Trul Slang is an absolute must as well. It's quite an emo. I was when I first saw it, I was quite emotional by mm. it all. Uh, but I think I think it's a story that shouldn't be ignored. And uh, you know, if you're there, you should go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but. On a lighter note, I mean, Cambodian food is is lovely. That's a, definitely a highlight. I particularly like the noodle soups, you know, like they serve in Cambodia and Vietnam, mm-hmm. you know, pho for breakfast or, you know, I, I tried to do that all the time when I was there. Good, good. Um, and, but I guess uh, some – I did stay clear of, uh, you know, grasshoppers and, and tarantulas. You know, oh. I, I, find, I find the legs tie, get stuck in your teeth, you know, so yep. I, I stay clear of them. But uh, other than that, you know, the food is, is certainly uh, superb and uh, I wouldn't hesitate eating any of it apart from the spiders. Yeah, perhaps. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Would, there, would you say that there's lots for, um, I guess, meat eaters and vegetarians or vegans oh, yeah, or anything? Absolutely, so there's yeah. a good variety. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a good variety. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I guess, what, did you have any final thoughts or anything else that you wanted to, to mention about Cambodia? Uh, well, apart from perhaps, you know, I mean, 
in particular when you're in a place like Phnom Penh, you know, you just need to be a little bit more sort of aware of your personal belongings and safety and that mm-hmm. sort of stuff because, you know, don't walk around with flash cameras hanging over your shoulders and, and that sort of stuff. But uh, I think, uh, you know, it's I certainly, I've been there f- a few times recently and never had in, any issues with uh, the food or anything like that, you know, even eating out from street stalls where you see they're popular you know you i found them to be uh safe to to use um and the other thing i guess is uh, you know cambodia despite having their own currency the real uh us dollars is is the the currency that everyone seems to use mm-hmm. uh but you know have small notes yep. because um you know everything is relatively cheap and if you have you give them a you know a 20 or 50 dollar note you know yeah. they may not have you right. know change yeah. to give to you and and you will find that you'll get change in cambodian real from time to time but they're they're quite handy to have anyway for small purchases and yeah. tips or whatever you whatever you like so yeah. us dollars is definitely the way to go and is there a lot of um fpos machines or anything or can you sort of tap and go at, at many yeah places? you can you know in in sort of the like up in Siem Reap, for example, if you go to there's a popular area called uh, Pub Street up there, which is full of sort of uh, restaurants and bars and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you can certainly tap and go at most of those places, mm. but if you go into the markets and that sort of stuff, then it's a uh, cash economy. Yeah, which is sort of expected. That's <laughs> yeah. fine. Cool. Yeah. All right, Mullins, that's been um, a great sort of overview on Cambodia. Um, thank you for for joining us today, and um, for anyone listening that wants to read more about Moen's experiences, you can always go to thewest.com.au forward slash travel. Thanks, Penny. No worries.